Greetings to each and every one of you, from myself, my wife, and the people of Aotearoa, New Zealand. It really is a privilege to be here and to have been invited to speak to the Business and Biodiversity platform. I've come quite a long way, about 10,000 kilometres, and um, it took about 14 hours, but it's already been really worth it. I've learnt an enormous amount in a very short space of time, and I hope in the future to learn a lot more. I'm going to start by giving you a little background on the biodiversity imperative in New Zealand, because this is what has led me to what I believe is a pragmatic approach to how we reverse the decline of biodiversity, not just in New Zealand, but in other countries around the world. Aotearoa New Zealand was once a forested landscape. 85% of our land was covered in forest of this style, temperate rainforest. And in one of the fastest and shortest periods of time known to humankind, we transformed our landscape enormously because New Zealand has only been occupied by people for approximately 700 years. That's a very short history. First an arrival by Māori, 700 years ago, and in the 1800s, the Europeans arrived. So we had an ecosystem which was dominated by birds and bugs. Birds and bugs. And the biggest of all our birds, the moa, now extinct, stood nearly three metres tall and was hunted to extinction by the Māori people. We converted our land in a period of 120 years to one dominated by pastoral agriculture. And the scene there on the screen, Canterbury Plains, where there is hardly any trace left of our indigenous biodiversity. More importantly, we brought a whole lot of pests into the country. We only had previously three mammal species, the bats, one of those is extinct, um, two still remain, but we brought in a whole lot of pests, rats, cats, stoats, weasels, ferrets, you name it, we brought it in. And as well, we brought in many, many plants. The vascular flora of New Zealand is only 2,500 species. It's a global biodiversity hotspot because not of the number of species, but because of the very high level of endemism. Over 80% of our plant species are found nowhere else in the world. And the only place that can top that is Hawaii, 95%. So we brought in a whole lot of plants. We now have more exotic plants naturalised in New Zealand than our indigenous native flora, more than 2,500. And we have 20,000 species sitting, waiting in our gardens to invade as environmental weeds. And in terms of extinction, the area that has been most affected are our birds. So we've lost 57 species of birds completely forever. We've only lost five plant species, so we're not doing too badly there. And of course, we've lost many, many of the bugs. Now, some people might say that's a good thing, but if you understand the way ecosystems operate, you know that you've got to have bugs. Bugs perform all sorts of services like pollination and decomposition, and you cannot afford to have an ecosystem without bugs. And we have lost an unknown number of bugs because we did not document them before we started losing them. And that image there is an image of a sub-fossil weevil. We had giant weevils all over our mainland before the arrival of rats and mice, and they've all become extinct even before we documented them. We did start moving on putting aside conservation estate quite early in our history. In fact, some of our earliest national parks were created in 1880, and we currently have 30% of our land area set aside as national parks and reserves. That's a great figure. But we all know that putting something into a reserve legally is not the same as protecting it because it still requires active management. And as well, 
the areas that we set aside were unrepresentative of the whole biodiversity of the country. We tended to set aside the bits that we couldn't develop. So all of the high ground, the mountain ranges and the tops of the mountains were set aside as national parks. And that one there is the one from where I was born. I was born at the foot of that mountain, the volcano Mount Taranaki. And you see the lovely circular boundary of the national park caused because the surveyor put his compass on the map and drew a circle and said that will be a national park. In our lowland and coastal zone, in recent years we've been very effective at convincing private landowners to set aside parts of their own property. And so we have this organisation called the Kui, Queen Elizabeth II National Trust that is setting aside covenants. And we now have over 114,000 hectares set aside this way, which is equivalent to three times the area of some of our smaller national parks. Our ecosystems have declined and degraded for the same reasons that your ecosystems have declined and degraded. Habitat loss, predation, competition by weeds, uh, environmental diseases, Phytophthora, killing forests, myrtle rust, and of course, more recently, the reason for decline is land use change and intensification of land use, particularly agricultural land use. And then we have the unknown impact of climate change. We're only just starting to get a handle on what the impacts of climate change might be. So the prognosis for our biodiversity in New Zealand is that it continues to decline on the mainland. The management required is in perpetuity. It, it has to be ongoing, an ongoing commitment. And ceasing management results in rapid loss. That has made us really focus on practically finding solutions. And our first solution started as way back as 1894, when Richard Henry, a famous um, zoologist in New Zealand, realised that if you moved our native birds onto offshore islands, away from the rats and the mice and the weasels and the ferrets, that was a way you could save them from extinction. He was followed closely by a man by the name of Don Merton in the New Zealand Wildlife Service, who started in 1976 with some very world-breaking efforts to save birds from extinction. New Zealand actually was perfectly designed to save birds because around our shores we have more than 220 small offshore islands and they were the places that thankfully we could move our birds to the offshore islands to save them. And one of the most famous ones of all, the Chatham Island Robin. It got down to four individuals and one female. And the work of the New Zealand Wildlife Service in the 1970s and 1980s, by translocating the bird to places that didn't have pests and undertaking some interesting cross-fostering by other birds, grew the population back up to its current level of more than 250 and have saved it, the bird from extinction. Otherwise, it would have just been on the $1 coin, which wouldn't be much use to those of us who love biodiversity. From 1995 on, we took another shift in the way we approached saving our biodiversity. We realised that we can't just save it on offshore islands, we've got to do something about it on the mainland of New Zealand as well. And that's when we started the programme known as the Mainland Island Programme whereby intensive pest management in the locations marked on the map there, we tried to reverse the decline on the mainland. That idea took off dramatically. The current state of mainland island sanctuaries is this. Every one of those dots is a place in New Zealand where we're doing intensive management to make sure we save our birds and our ecosystem. And so, we call these biodiversity sanctuaries. What are biodiversity sanctuaries? They're places where we do this intensive management. We reintroduce missing species. 
we manage the risk of reinvasion by pests, and we inspire and galvanise communities to look after their own backyard, local conservation. So currently there are 73 of these sanctuaries across New Zealand and 42 of them are not run by government agencies, they are run by the community. This is the one closest to where I live, in Hamilton, in a place near Cambridge, Maunga Totari Ecological Island, a small volcano, 3,500 hectares, completely fenced with a predator-proof fence, with a grill on it so small that even a baby mouse cannot crawl through the fence. And inside that fence, all of the pests have been killed and removed, and that allows us to bring back our much-loved birds. Birds like the hihi, the kaka, the tiaki, and the most important one of all for New Zealanders, the kiwi. So you all know that I'm a kiwi, and that's a kiwi. And this is what we identify with, the kiwi bird. So I've become very interested in recent time in wondering whether or not we can just do some conservation, not just in the backcountry, in the wildland, in the Department of Conservation National Parks, but can we do it in the city, where we all live? Because the most important thing we need to do is to reconnect humans with the environment. Not have the environment separate from humans, but connected to humans, and especially connected to children. And where do we do it in New Zealand? Increasingly, New Zealand actually is an urban nation. 87% of people live in towns and cities. They don't live in the rural zone at all. You can drive around the rural zone, you won't even see people, they're not out there. So this is where we are starting to do our conservation now. In Hamilton, we've been doing it in these places called Hamilton Gullies, right within the city. There are 750 hectares of gully habitat, streamside habitat, where we've been working on planting and bringing back habitat. We started this in about the year 2000, focused on these gullies. This is what a gully looks like in our city. Most of those gullies were dominated by introduced weeds and we have been progressively taking the weeds out and putting back the native forest. And our target ecosystem is one that we've designed by our understanding of macrofossils, um, composition of remnants, knowing what used to be there and bringing it back. So, this is what you can do in seven years on the left and what you can do in 20 years on the right. You can bring it back. So we've also been working on a very special sort of a park called a Natural Heritage Park, again in Hamilton City, where we're trying to bring back all the ingredients of the original ecosystems that had been completely removed because the ultimate experiment for an ecologist like me is to reconstruct an ecosystem. This is the progress we've made in 10 years. And we are reconnecting with people, especially young people. Every other day, we bring in the people, we bring in the plants, 23,000 plants, 1,700 people, three hours of work, and we've created three hectares of new forest. Again, we're doing this to bring back the birds. And the bird that is our target bird in New Zealand, in the city, is Tui. It's got this amazing little fluffy bit of white feather under its chin. So the European name for it is the parson bird. You know the parson in the church? That's the Tui. So combined with all of the planting and an intensive pest control program 15 kilometers around our city, we have reached what is called the Tui tipping point. After 120 years of absence from our city, we have brought back the Tui. So my key point here is that the new frontier for conservation in New Zealand is actually the urban area. Urban restoration is the new frontier. That's the end of chapter one. I'm now into chapter two. 
I'm just going to give you some conceptual and strategic framework about how we operate now in New Zealand, which I think will become increasingly relevant to what you are interested in. Because of this history I've just outlined, we realised that we could not carry on the way we've been going for the last 150 years, because actually to make progress with reversing biodiversity decline, you cannot have an adversarial resource management model where developers and conservationists are in conflict. And we've been progressively trying to develop coordinated, integrated approaches forming the best teams in New Zealand. We're also aware of what's going on internationally in the same way that you are, that actually what's good for nature is also good for business. And this is a recent video that's available on YouTube that you can, you can have a look at. The chief scientist from the Nature Conservancy, an amazing video about what's good for nature is good for business. In New Zealand, we've started recognizing this. We've also started realising that you need to value nature in different ways. Um, and people in business know this intuitively. You need to value things so that people really understand what they're losing and what it might cost to replace it. And the way we've been approaching it is by natural capital assessment and assessment of the value of nature for biodiversity and ecosystem services. And Bed, my wife here, is one of the authors of one of the chapters in the book there on ecosystem services in New Zealand. We've also realised that the way we operate our government departments needs to change quite radically. And one of the things we've just done in New Zealand is completely restructured our Department of Conservation. Previously, the Department of Conservation managed the asset. That's all they did. They took government funding and managed the asset. Recently, we have restructured the department into two main parts, the part that manages the asset and the part that forms the partnerships with business and industry so that they can access the funding and the knowledge and the know-how to do it better. This has been a very significant shift in the way we operate in New Zealand. At the same time, this is what I've been doing for the last two years of my life in New Zealand. I've been working extremely hard on putting together what is called the Biological Heritage National Science Challenge. This is mission-led research to support all of the partners who are trying to reverse the decline of biodiversity. So the government has put new money into the challenge and we are developing this partnership approach, a coordinated partnership approach where rather than competing and contesting for the funding, we're coming together in a partnership to work together to help reverse the decline of biodiversity. So we've realised that private funding is essential for conservation because the government funding will never be sufficient. That's the case in my country anyway. And therefore we also understand that you know, development will continue. We have tools like offsetting and mitigation that we can use, but business and biodiversity can and must be compatible because we need each other to make this work. Another thing that's happening in our country is that we are moving into a phase where philanthropy is becoming more and more important. So we are looking at ways of strategically utilising philanthropy to support biodiversity. So biodiversity offsetting is becoming more common. Compensation for development. Um, Biobanks in some parts of New Zealand are, becoming, are coming under, into development. All of these things can help resolve development versus biodiversity. And putting together the research, engagement and collaboration and enhancement will help in building back our biodiversity. I'm one of the scientists in New Zealand who promotes the idea that you must talk to everybody. You are not there to have a conflict between the environmentalist and the business 
Actually, you need to engage with all parties without fear or favour and work together to find the solutions. And in fact, in New Zealand, we are boosting engagement with energy, primary sector, and big industry. The third chapter and the last chapter in my story is to look at examples of profitable business supporting nature. Before I get into some of that, I just wanted to remind you that the view there is actually the most important business in New Zealand, as far as nature is concerned, because it is the one that earns the second most income revenue for our country, tourism, and it is all entirely based on nature. The need for people to come and visit and see these amazing views, scenery, activities, all connected with our landscape. $62.5 million a day coming into our country because of scenery like this. I've seen scenery just like this in my tour around Sri Lanka. I'm sure it's the same here. What I did was do a quick analysis before I came on this trip. And I talked to the members of the Sustainable Business Network in New Zealand and some of my colleagues who are ecologists. And we decided am amongst ourselves in a really unscientific survey actually, that these businesses are probably the seven best examples in New Zealand of businesses combining nature and profit together. So I won't read them all out, I'll just quickly skim through to the diagram here which explains what, what they're doing. So here are the categories where we've classified the seven businesses and these are the things that they're doing in relation to nature. So carbon neutral, biodiversity offset mitigation, circular economy where they're using their own waste to provide energy for their business, capacity building where they're training the community to be the people who go out and help do the work for biodiversity, ecosystem services evaluation, and restoring species and ecosystems, and funding research on species and ecosystems. Those are the, the seven best examples in New Zealand, and this is what they're doing. I also thought I'd quickly talk about possibly the best example I could find in New Zealand at the moment because of those seven criteria, this business fits the bill for six of them. Mighty River Power, which is an energy company based in the Waikato and is listed on our stock exchange. It was a government agency, but then it was privatised and now has shareholders like any other business and it generates between 15 to 17 percent of New Zealand's electricity. New Zealand as a strong energy industry based on renewables. 80 percent of our energy is renewable energy. So the Waikato system is quite close to where I live and is based on New Zealand's longest river and it has a catchment as you can see there of just over 14 square kilometres. Nine power stations all in a row down the river supplying the power for Waikato and a large part of the North Island of New Zealand. The model that they use is what they call the guardianship model. And in Māori, the indigenous language, the word is kaitiakitana, or guardianship. This is the concept of looking after the place where you live, being part of the place where you live, looking after it, building partnerships, making a living but at the same time treating the environment softly and sustainably. And this is the model that Mighty River Power follows. So they built strong relationships with indigenous people, the Maori people of New Zealand, and they fund compensation and mitigation for the use of the resource and for the, to pay, pay back, if you like, to pay back for damage done when the dams were developed. And they do this through a trust called the Waikato Ecological Enhancement Trust. 
So you can see there that the history of the trust is that it was developed as part of the reconsenting process for the river system and a collaboration in relation to ecological research, interpretation, uh, agreed mitigation. The trust is made up of representatives of the community who have the biggest interest in the river and the resources in the river. You can also see that so far the trust has invested 3.2 million dollars in 178 projects and a further 1.83 million dollars is to be committed. So 2015 is year 12 in the 38 year life of the trust. From the map you can see the distribution of the projects that they're involved with and again you can see that they are spread right across the catchment of the Waikato River, the catchment of the, of the main river of the Waikato region, a diverse set of projects including largely wetland restoration but also some other ecosystems as well. And here an image of the teams, one of the teams, so you remember the comment about capacity building, so here we have a team of people who've been trained in how to best plant up the riparian zone of the river. So essentially the plants are put in place, you can see them there with their little weed mats to protect them from weed invasion and they are putting those plants in mainly to buffer and protect the river margin to prevent in particular the runoff of nutrient from the adjacent farmland. Another project that Mighty River Power have been involved in is in relation to enhancing the populations of the native fish, the eel, the freshwater eel that lives in the rivers and they do this in two main ways. They have what's called the Alba Catch and Carry process so remembering that the young elvers of the eel migrate up the rivers to colonise the, uh, the waterways and so if you want them to move through the hydro system you actually have to assist them by lifting them, bringing them across the barrier formed by the, each of the dams in the Waikato hydro system. And so the graph here really is just showing the enormous numbers of elvers that are collected at the foot of each of the dams and then assisted and taken across, transferred across the dam so that they can continue their journeys up the waterway. In the same way that Mighty River Power funds the protection of the Alba colonisation in the river, they also need to consider the adult eel because the adult eel, of course, needs to traverse downstream, down the rivers, and then go out into the ocean where they lay their eggs and start the cycle all over again. So there have been many attempts made to develop new styles of stream passage by providing a mechanism for the eels to get through the dam without going through the turbine and being minced up. So you can see here one example of the sort of little pipe or tunnel that's been created along the side of the dam to allow the eels coming downstream to migrate back out to the main ocean. You can also see in the image there the size that some of these freshwater eels reach. Quite enormous, enorm enormous creatures. So of course being an energy company, Mighty River Power is very strongly interested in how you use renewable energy in a range of ways and most importantly they've been strongly involved in advocating for the use of electricity as the power source for cars and here's their uh, chief executive officer sitting in one of the electric cars. So not only the advocacy role of the company but also providing some of the infrastructure for recharging of these cars in the workplace. So there are various points around the city where they've been involved in setting up the infrastructure that allow people who drive the electric car to do the recharging needed to keep them on the road. So you've now seen some examples from New Zealand and of course the question is how do the New Zealand examples compare with what happens elsewhere in the world? Now there's not much uh, published on this point but I have been able to find some examples from Europe and um, what, what that um, research does show that what we're doing in New Zealand is very comparable with what's happening in Europe and in particular the project known as One Europe More Nature and in the same way that we saw the wide range of sectors and businesses involved in New Zealand, the same is occurring in Europe. The common themes there also are around businesses that promote values and guardianship 
and projects which are conceived as being intergenerational in their impact, not just over the short term but focused on providing change over the long term, intergenerational projects. The businesses that did well in Europe were also considered to be ones that did not just reduce their environmental footprint, not merely reduce their environmental footprint, but actually actively created or enhanced aspects of the landscape, the biodiversity or both. And the biggest advantage to business in taking this approach is that businesses that do this sort of work, do the mitigation, the compensation, the creation or enhancement of the landscape and biodiversity are able to derive a premium positioning in terms of the marketplace. And this is definitely true for the companies in New Zealand that I've just outlined to you. So the challenge is in front of us. And, and the point that I want to conclude on really is that I've given you a range of examples of how people can work together cooperatively, how they can integrate their activities. And the big challenge for New Zealand is can we broaden and deepen our performance? And as indicated in the book published in 2012, Super, Cooperat Super Cooperators, altruism, evolution, and why we need each other to succeed, can we work together more closely to achieve what some people call super cooperation and use this to help us reverse the decline in biodiversity? Thank you very much.